So today I, uh, I want to go over something that uh, isn't always talked about enough, and um, that's cooking and optimization. Um, and it's going to be a bit of a technical talk, and I'll do my best to keep it simple so people can understand. Um, but a lot of it I'm going to be explaining how things work. So um, if you want to open the file I gave you uh, called uh, cooking optimization .toe. you'll be able to follow along with that um, but uh, don't worry about um, building things out or copying what I'm doing on screen just sit back relax and listen to what I'm explaining uh, if you want to go back later of course this video will be online uh, afterwards on YouTube uh, from TDSW so you can go back again and try to rebuild some of the things I do um, basically I, I want to help everyone um, understand the cooking process in touch designer so that you can design your your projects uh, for better performance um, sometimes we run out and buy a new computer or a new gpu just to get that extra bit of performance but really there's maybe a lot more you can do in your project to do the same um, so also to learn about some techniques um, used to troubleshoot project performance and uh, these are things that uh, can help you identify the problem and then uh, finally Later on uh, in the third part of the workshop, we'll, we'll look at these lessons applied um, in a scene changer project, which is designed to minimize cooking um, on, on a playback system with uh, many scenes. So you don't want all your scenes cooking if you're not using them, and uh, we've developed a, a base system that you can, you can build on. So um, I'll start with just how cooking works and best practices to optimize and pitfalls. Um, and then we'll go into some optimization and troubleshooting tools, uh, followed by a real world example. We're going to take a project and, and optimize it for like two to three X performance if we can. Um, and then uh, the last part, like I said, we'll do uh, the scene changer. So let's, let me pull up touch. And of course, please ask questions. Um, uh, and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, Nihongo is, is fine as well because Harada will translate for me. So, um, yeah. Okay, just to start, I want to introduce how we can check on cooking. Um, a lot of people just build things out and then realize, oh, this is working slowly, what's going on? And um, so we're just going to go through all the ways you can monitor your cooking, first of all, so we can get a grasp on that. And uh, the the one we always use uh, is the middle mouse button uh, on, on the node here. Um, you have your total cooks, how many times this operator is cooked, and the cook time on the CPU and the GPU. Um, so that can also be accessed, by the way, in this little information up here in the parameters. If you don't have a middle mouse, uh, let's say you're on your laptop, which is a trackpad. But let me... Uh, turn this on and uh, the transform, I have a little expression here, so it's always cooking. All right. So the other way you can monitor cooking, and I'll do that a lot today, is through an info chop. So I'm just gonna put and connect the info chop here. And there's a bunch of channels about cooking here. Um, the two that I'm going to highlight today is um, cook time and total cooks. So let's just select those here, cook time and total cooks. Okay, so this can be um, super helpful because you can then put in a trail chop towards the end and just monitor what's happening as you're making changes. Um, this trail chop is giving us a little window of four seconds. So um, let's just turn this off again. Now, you'll notice something that uh, this, by connecting this info, it's actually making this noise chop cook. Um, one of the features of the info chop is it has a toggle called passive. And if you turn on passive, um, it won't force something to cook unless it's supposed to. So that's a, maybe a better way of monitoring your total cooks when you don't want to um, trick something into cooking. So now if I turn this on and it starts cooking, then I'm getting my, my uh, data updating. All right. So a little bit further down here, I have a perform chop. Um, this is actually something that has been slightly uh, improved over the last build. So we're running on build 2020, 
27390. And uh, we've added this CPU frame time, and we've also improved the way active and total ops is reported. But uh, basically, this will always monitor your whole system, and uh, I often use it for uh, the frame time here, which is in milliseconds. Um, this the CPU uh, time per frame, the, the amount of time the CPU is taking to calculate. Um, and these I find really handy. It tells you how many app ops are actually cooking, active ops, and how many total ones are in your system. So in fact, I, I've made a little um, stats component here, which you can just pop up as a floating window in any project you're working on and just kind of have running. Um, or you can composite it over a top if you're wanting to see this in perform mode, for example. Um, this is also found here in the TOX folder. You'll find it under stats.talks, so you can get it later. All right. Um, another way of uh, monitoring cooking is uh, the op find dat. The op find dat allows you to uh, basically look at any uh, component and get all the operators inside it. So if you go over a few column uh, pages to this columns page, you can turn on CPU time, GPU time, CPU memory, and GPU memory. So if I make this um, really wide, All right, and you'll see here that I have all this cook start, uh, cook start time, cook end time, um, cook frame, GPU cook time. Um, now, right now it's not updating. Uh, that's because the op find uh, usually needs a, a pulse to update, but we can change it to always if we want, and then it'll give us a live feed of all the cook times in our system. And you can select these columns out and do sums if you want, or just look at um, certain operators, for example, maybe I just want all the tops. I just want to look at what my tops are doing. So I could just come in here and only look at the tops by just selecting top family. So it's actually really powerful and quite handy. Um, uh, so the yeah, find that is, is pretty good for performance monitoring. Um, next up, we you can also use just Python itself. Um, all uh, the op class has all of these as members. So if we were to go into the Python help and we look down into the op class, so this is hierarchical. Here's op class, and then we go down to cooking. All the cook information is here in members. So you can query it um, in your scripts or you can. In this case, I've just put these expressions into a table that and then put it into an evaluate that and um, I'm getting those numbers out. All right. So those aren't cooking live right now. Um, the other thing that's nice about this is it has a GPU, uh, sorry, as children CPU and children GPU cook time. So you can point it to, for example, I'll just turn on this and you'll see it's looking at all of the children of audio analysis. So everything that's inside, if you middle mouse click on this operator, you see it down here, the children CPU cook time, and children GPU cook time. All right, so that's a good way of getting at that information. Um, moving on. Um, now, one thing uh, a lot of people tend to do is, or they notice uh, about cooking is when something's cooking, you see the little, the animated lines moving. I don't know if you can see that over Zoom, but you know what I mean? When the lines are animating, that means that there, there's some data flowing or some cooking going on. Um, so that can be used really quickly at, at a glance to see when something's cooking. But uh, you should use it carefully because um, it doesn't always mean every node that is cooking. For example, if I do this, this is animating, and this is cooking, and this is cooking. But this one here is animating too, but this node here isn't cooking. So what the animation really means is the, the node before is cooking, or the input is cooking. This node here isn't cooking. So just don't get confused when you're looking at those lines. It doesn't mean that everything connected to it is cooking. 
it's the, the node prior to it. Um, any questions on that? It's pretty, it's pretty standard stuff uh, if you've dug into to touch a little bit. Um, let's just look at a few other ways of monitoring um, more like tools uh, before getting into why things cook. So obviously we have the performance monitor. Now the performance monitor looks big and scary, but it actually can be very useful for when you're really trying to troubleshoot a big, like a problem that you've, you, you need specifics on. When you click on this, it will grab all of the things that cook that frame into, into one long list, all right? And you'll notice that there is these little green bars and they travel from left to right. And this is basically the order that the system is cooking in. So um, it, can be, it can be used to see like, we're rendering a window here and at this point, it had to go and draw the chop graphs and then it came up and continued to render a window. Then it had to go down here and draw the chop graphs again for this guy. And then it came up and it finished. So uh, you can so sometimes see dependencies and um, it can be used to isolate certain parts of the system. So by isolating, I mean, what if you just want to see all the, the noise, um, the noise chops or the noise, anything called noise. You can put in a filter down here, noise. And if I analyze then, I only get the noise operators, anything with noise in it. So you can, you can highlight that quite easily. Or uh, maybe like there's got to be a movie file in here. And uh, if I put star and star, star is a wild card, so it'll match anything before and after. Then we'll see, ah, we have a movie file in cooking over here. There's actually two of them. Okay. So just remember to remove that when you're done. Uh, the other thing you can do is use this little monitor tab uh, to decide what you want to look at. Maybe you just want to look at your scripts. You could turn off all these checkboxes and just look at script times, for example. And lastly, the one thing that is super useful is this frame trigger. If um, you're looking for a, uh, something in your system is causing a frame drop, but it's not consistent, like you're running at 60 frames a second, and then every few minutes, you'll drop a frame. What you can do is put in a number here that is higher than 16 milliseconds, like 18 milliseconds, and click on this. Now it won't fire or it won't capture the frame until the frame time goes over 18 milliseconds. So let's say I go in here and I, I change something. Maybe if I turn on this, okay, just by clicking on it, the frame time was 24 milliseconds and this triggered. So I got a capture of that frame and actually what's taking so long in this frame, you know. So this can be really useful for when you're trying to find those hidden frame drops. Okay. Now, the other tool that is uh, really helpful and uh, we're going to use quite a bit today is the probe in the palette. So if you go into the palette and go into the tools folder and pull out the probe, um, this is a visual uh, monitor and um, it does cook. So I don't recommend leaving it in your system or when you're done with it uh, to turn it off. It's a tool that does take some uh, performance to run but it gives you a really visual way of finding problems with your system. So you just come over here to parameters and say open. And this is a map of uh, the root. See, this is the, the root right here. And we see, oh, there's project one. Um, I'm inside project one right now. So let's go inside there. And now I can see my entire network. If I minimize that, and if I home this, that's the same network, right? So, We'll just bring up the probe again and I can see everything that's cooking. The color here indicates how long it takes and the size as well. Um, you can also change it to the GPU time if I want to see how much my GPU is getting hit. So these ones over here are all tops running on the GPU as are these little guys here. This big one down here is the probe itself so we can ignore that. And you can look at memory usage as well. Um, so it's a very nice and easy way of identifying where the problem is and then allowing you to dive in and, and focus on that. Um, the last one is something that uh, I use from time to time when building projects just to see how things are going. And um, it's pretty popular in the community. 
So if we go back to the TOX uh, folder I gave you, um, there's something called a cook bar, uh, cook bar V2. And this is available on um, Anton, uh, Anton's GitHub, but I also included it here. I think he has his GitHub in here. Yeah, Anton from uh, hexagons.se. A uh, guy in Sweden who makes some really nice stuff uh, for iOS and touch. So here, by putting this in your project, you'll get these little bars over everything that's cooking. And this down here is a memory, uh, I think it's memory usage, bottom bar, GPU memory. So uh, you'll see here, uh, this top is taking a little bit of time to cook. But if I was to make this resolution like 4K, it's taking a lot more time to cook and the memory usage is going up. So it's a real like uh, in the zone way of looking at things. Um, and uh, over here, you can see the stuff is cooking quite a bit and, and it's showing you uh, how much memory it's using. So just another cool tool uh, to get rid of it. You, you can just uh, delete it um, and uh, it'll go away. So. All right, uh, let's go back to talk about when an operator cooks. So why does an operator cook? There's actually two things that are required to trigger a, a cook in Touch Designer. And the first thing is, is the operator dirty? And what that means is, has the data been modified in that operator? Um, so if it's changed, it needs one more thing to happen before it'll cook. And that's, does it get a cook request? Is something requesting it to cook? Just by changing its data, it does not always cook. You actually need someone to look or want to use that data. So what makes an operator dirty? Um, anything that modifies an operator will make it, mark it as dirty. So we can change a parameter value, or you can change some state like the flags. Um, uh, if its data on its input is changed, that will also trigger it. And dirty, the dirty state will actually propagate down the chain from, from the top of the chain down. So here's a little um, visual of that. Let's say we have constant one here and we change the parameter. It will become dirty and it will also uh, propagate its changes down to math and null. So both of these nodes will become dirty. That means if, if, if they are asked for their data, they will cook. So let's, let's go back to touch and just look at that a little bit over here. So I have, I have this constant here and <clears throat> these aren't this cooked by turning on the viewer. So it, it increased its cook. And if I do it here, oh, it'll cook once, so it'll increase its cook. Now, if I um, if I change this, all right, it's cooking because I, wait a second. Yeah, it's cooking because I'm changing that value, but these ones aren't, but these are now dirty. So if I decide to view it, it does, because it has to update its value, all right? So another way I could look at that is making something dirty doesn't change it is this this will actually change the value of constant three here. But because we're not looking at it and we're not requesting its data, it won't cook. So let's run this script. So we just ran a script and this value should be two, but it hasn't, no one needs it yet because we have this passive flag on, no one is asking for that data. So it hasn't cooked. Now, as soon as I turn on the viewer, the data has to be displayed, so then it cooks. All right, so that was the cook request by turning on the viewer. So that's just, just to th put it in your mind, any change will propagate down the list or anything that is going out of these lines will propagate out um, to other nodes. Now, that doesn't make it cook necessarily. We need a cook request. So requests for cooking can include viewing the node viewer. Just looking at the node uh, is looking at the data. So that means we have to ask for it. All right. Parameter dialog uh, open for the operator. That will actually cause it to cook. 
Um, that's because the parameter dialog is looking at the information inside that operator, so it, it forces it. Another op is referencing the data. So whether you're using an expression or a chop export or uh, maybe a select op, um, whenever you're grabbing data from another operator, that's referencing it. So it'll it'll ask for a cook request and ask for its data. And finally, um, some device ops or networking ops, uh, because they're connected to a device that's constantly polling it, or they might be connected to a network that is constantly asking for data, those operators might always uh, cook, have cook requests built in. So again, if the op was dirty and it gets a cook request, then it will cook. All right. So let's just uh, look at the next slide and then we'll look at it back in touch center. Now the cooking is a pull system. So what happens is cook requests go back up the chain. Let's say all of these op, whoops, I want to go back. Let's say all of these ops are dirty because we changed the value in constant one. And then I want to look at no one. I, let's say I export it or I turn on this viewer. So it will ask, it'll cook request, it'll ask for its data and that will travel up to math one because it asks for the information on the input. It says, ah, I need the data for the input. So it goes up to math one and then Math one will do the same. It's dirty and it needs its data from its input. So it will go back up and it will ask for the data from constant and we'll have everything cook. So the cooking is actually a pull system in Touch Designer, which some people know, but a lot of people don't realize that. And once you understand that, you can start developing systems that automatically turn off or automatically optimize when you're not using a certain part of it. So let's look at that inside a uh, network. Okay. So for example, why, why is this cooking right now? Uh, I just have to check why is this cooking right now? Okay. Ah, sorry, I, I didn't mean to do that. There we go. Okay. So right now, if I turn on this, this is not cooking, but if I turn on its viewer, that's going to start it cooking because I'm asking for its data. But notice that the rest of these downstream are not, they don't need, they're not being used. Now, if I go to the end of the stream, it's going to request the data from HSV adjust, then up to transform, and this whole line will cook. All of these are cooking right now. Now, also, because if I, for example, if I had a select operator here, just by doing this, it's going to do the same because it's referencing this data in this. Number. So that whole chain now is cooking. Um, another example might be. I'll turn on this export here. Now, this operator here, I've selected it so that the parameter dialog is, view, is being viewed. And just by doing that, I'm asking to see the value of saturation multiplier, which is being exported to by this chop. So that entire chain of chops now is cooking because it has to go back up to null one, ask for its data, and then it goes up to math one and up to math three and LFO four. Don't be thrown off by these lines. Remember, these lines just mean that this one is cooking. This is not cooking here. And this is not cooking here. That, that those, that's why those lines can sometimes be a little bit uh, confusing. So um, if I close the parameter dialog, I'm no longer asking for that data. All these stop cooking. All right. Now, if I just look at the viewer, all right. So starting to make sense a little bit. Um, same thing down here, there's a transform SOP. And right now this LFO isn't cooking because it has no reason to, no one's asking for its data. But if I turn on this, this transform of the sphere, because it's uh, just a export of the chop, now this LFO has to cook because its data is getting updated every time.
so the cook the cooking is pulling the opposite direction of the data flow, but that lets us do um, uh, a lot of optimization because if you don't need a certain if, for example, I duplicated this and I put a switch in here, let's just put a switch in here. Okay. Now, if I go to number one, this whole line here is cooking, but this whole line up here is not cooking. Well, except for this noise, because I have this connected, but regardless, this is not cooking. It's automatically turned off. And then when I switch back to here, it, it switches and this automatically turns off. So we don't need this stuff and it doesn't have to cook every frame sort of self-optimizing. Okay. So. All right. So. Now that would be simple and easy, except I did mention that there's some operators that always cook and that's why I turned off uh, this, this cook flag on this component here. Some operators will always cook. Um, so device operators like, um, well, the video device in because it's connected to a camera that's sending its data all the time. But uh, the video device out, as soon as I turn this on, even if I turn off the viewers, um, it's going to keep cooking because it's trying to connect to a device driver and that driver is asking for frames every second. So a lot of these cases, there will be an active flag you can use to turn off to keep it from cooking when you're not using it. But just to be aware, um, a lot of these operators will cook all the time. Uh, audio device out is the same. Um, if I turn it on, okay. If I turn off all these things, it's still going to cook because it's connected to the audio device. And in fact, the audio device out even has a cook every frame flag um, just to make sure that it always cooks because you don't want your music stopping. All right. Um, the DMX is a similar situation. Um, the DMX out shop uh, is connecting to the network or the device, whether it's ArtNet and SACN on the network side or if it's a USB device. It constantly is feeding those systems data, so it's always going to cook. And that means that the things upstream will always cook as well. So uh, careful consideration when you're designing your networks for, for these things. Um, I'll just quickly go through these uh, because you can check them out later in the file. But uh, all networking operators, uh, when they're connected to trying to connect to the network, they're just they're there for something to connect to, so they have to cook every frame. Um, they don't know who's going to connect or when someone's going to ask for its data, so they're cooking all the time. Um, MIDI out and OSC out are the same. Um, they're connected to devices, um, so they're going to cook all the time. Uh, I have them all turned off right now, but they'll act the same way. Um, the sync operators, which are only in Pro, but they're designed to keep two toe files in sync all the time. Um, they will always cook because obviously they have to to keep the two uh, processes um, in lockstep. So uh, that's by design, they have to. Um, for memory sharing, such as uh, Siphon or DirectX, let me just turn these on. Now notice the viewers, the viewers aren't on, but because they are putting textures into memory for another application to use, they're going to cook all the time, no matter what. So anything connected to that network will, will cook all the time. So something to keep in mind. And also video stream out is a good case as well. Uh, it's the same idea. You're sending out a stream to something like if you're using RTMP, like, uh, I don't know, YouTube or Twitch or Facebook. Um, so it's going to be cooking uh, every frame. The other thing to think about is time dependent operators in chops, especially um, time dependent ops will cook all the time. Uh, so the timeline chop, the beat chop, the clock chop, these all are, st are, are running on the timeline um, or touches built in time and that will cause them to cook. The LFO as well um, is always changing because it's time sliced. Um, and the noise, if you made this time sliced as well, um, then it's, it's changing its values every frame. So um, it will be updating. So, um, and last but not least, um, other things that can cook every frame are execute dats. So especially ones like the execute that uh, here has a frame start and a frame end. And if you put this on, it will 
cook every frame no matter what. So use it with caution um, or just be aware of what you're doing and make sure that it's not uh, a heavy script. And for the op execute, uh, there's a pre cook function and a post cook function, which will do something uh, before an operator cooks or an after an operator cooks. So obviously that happens with every cook. And lastly, uh, all of these operators are the execute, data chop execute, data execute, panel execute, and, and there's a quite a few of them. But um, using these, uh, just be aware of your, your settings. If you have something like, uh, well, while off on this chop and I'm monitoring this constant, while it's zero, this is going to cook every frame. So it's going to try to run that script every frame. So just be aware um, of how you set up your scripts and make sure they're not overcooking. So the goal when we're designing um, the goal when we're designing things is to have something that does not cook when you're not using it. So right now, if I look at this particle effects component, it is not cooking because no one is using its information. Now, when I turn on its viewer, it starts cooking, two milliseconds, so two and a half, and 1.7 on the GPU. Or if I was to, you know, attach a null, you're asking for the data, so it's going to start cooking, and that's good. But we've designed this has been designed so that it doesn't cook when it's not needed. And you go inside, this whole system comes alive. But you don't, if you don't need it, it shouldn't cook. So that's the key thing to try to do. Um, uh, when you're building. Let's look at some SOPS tricks, um, some good techniques for SOPS. So first of all, um, SOPS are heavy on the CPU. So it's one of the things that you can spend some time in and really improve your performance in a project. Um, now one of the things that we should always try to do is to put operators that don't need to cook higher up the chain. So for example, this is a, a point stop and a sword stop. And often people will, you know, get a spear, put down a noise, and then they realize, ah, you know what, before my particle stop, I want to do something with a point stop. And then I want to sort uh, all the points randomly so that I get a nice random, uh, random particle system like this. But what they've, what this has done is because this noise stop has to cook every frame, now these ones have to cook every frame as well, because, because this is making everything else dirty down the chain. So in reality, in this point, all we're doing here is uh, adding some normals, um, or in this sort stop, we're just randomizing the, the point order. A much better way of doing this would be to put these higher in the chain, like over here, and have the noise right before the particle. So these things don't cook unnecessarily. Let's, let's just do this. Now this network has the same effect. The point stop is adjusting all the points as we see fit. And then the sort stop is randomizing that point number and then the noise is moving them. But look at the, the, these are not, not cooking anymore. So that can have huge uh, ramifications when your geometry is heavy and you're starting to cook things unnecessarily. Um, I had another example here with uh, <clears throat> the car, but it's the same idea. You'd want to put anything that doesn't need to change before this animated stop. Now, um, another thing is, uh, Transforms. So the transform stop, um, I have a little B here, uh, which I've included in the media folder, and it has about 3,000 polygons and 1,600 points. So I'm just moving it up and down. But uh, in the transform stop, it's uh, much heavier than using a transform um, on a geometry component. Now the reason is, is the transform stop, it actually has to move every single point individually. So all the points are moving. So we're doing 1600 transforms here in this transform stop. And that ends up being almost a one millisecond cook time. Now, if you move something, uh, I'm using the same data here to move, move it. 
if you move something here on the geometry level, this is moving the entire object as one object on the GPU. It's already been pushed up to the GPU in this uh, for rendering, and now you're just moving that one object all as one, one transform. So it, it is much faster. Um, you'll see like this is almost no cook time here, 0 0.023 milliseconds. So when it's possible, try to do your transforms in the geometry component and not in the SOP. Um, it's not always possible, but uh, sometimes it is. Um, the other other way, uh, the other thing that you can speed up is don't use the material SOP if you can avoid it. Always put your materials on um, the render page of the geometry component. And it's for a similar reason. Um, the material here, if I put it here, is uh, there's a material call for every primitive in this, in this uh, object versus here you're having one material call for the entire object. So um, depending on your geometry and your scene, that can make a very big difference in performance. So that's just a few things on SOPs. Um, a lot of work in SOPs you should always look at is, can I instance this after you get something like a particle system or if, you, if can you use G, GPU instancing for SOPs, SOP work instead of having tons of SOPs? And you should always try to have as few SOPs as possible animating or, or cooking. Uh, the other thing to watch out for is also geometry type. Um, there is many types of geometry and you might import different types through you know, FBX or whatever. But you really want to stay with uh, polygon or mesh are the fastest. Um, polygons probably a little bit slightly faster, but um, and stay away from NURBS and Beziers. They're, they're much heavier. In the end, before everything's rendered, everything is turned into a polygon anyways. So if you can do that work ahead of time, uh, it saves your project from doing it. So try to work in polygon space if you can. All right, let's go up a level and jump into chops here. So I have quite a few things here. Um, some things to watch out for, really. Uh, sometimes you'll have chops that are not time sliced, and uh, you'll see that its position here is zero. It's at frame zero. And then you have another chop like this that it, it is time sliced, and it's actually moving, uh, moving in time in this LFO. And sometimes you might do a math or a merge and use some settings that actually, what it does is it places the one, one sample at the beginning and this sample continues to get longer. So you're making a channel that's really, really long. Um, this isn't good for a number of reasons, but it can also be heavy if you're dealing with tons of channels. Um, the things to watch out for are, for example, the channel pre-ops. Like if I was to say positive here, it does that. Um, or if I was to say combine chop the channels, uh, it does that. But uh, you could you could do it uh, just on this channel first. Like I could do a math here, and I could say pre-op here, and you know I get the same effect, but I don't have the merging problem that I had with a math shop. So something just to watch out for. Um, OK. So let me just see here. Here's an example. Um, What I want to show here is some operators, like lags and filters, um, always cook. So right now, I'm just, uh, I'm just moving this constant. And you'll notice that the lag, the filter, and the slope continue to cook. And everything downstream from them cooks. Uh, that's because these types of filters are time dependent. So to calculate their data, they look at two frames, the frame before and the, and the current frame. Uh, or in this case, the current in the next sample. Um, and that means that they become time dependent and cause things downstream to cook. So uh, when you need to use them, uh, sometimes putting them later in your chain can be beneficial. So you don't want to put it right at the top because then everything will cook. Um, and it's just something to be aware of.
and what else here do I have? Okay. Something about um, something about uh, dats here um, is changing uh, something in a table. Um, and this is something we're working on optimizing in Touch Designer, but changing something on a table causes all of the cells to cook. So um, it's something when you have a very big table and a lot of things looking into it, uh, you can cause a lot of unnecessary cooking. For example, in this case, I have three, just three columns, um, but I, if I want to change the word bananas to single banana, you'll see just by changing this cell, all, all three cells cooked, which caused all um, of these to cook. Now we're currently working on optimizing our cooking so that, um, so that this doesn't happen with that cells. Um, and it also occurs with chop channels. So I, I thought I had an example here of that. Um, okay, I can just make an example here. So if I have um, three channels, all right, and I have uh, a constant, let's just say. Okay. Actually, uh, sorry, I meant to do this. So if I come in here and I change, um, and let's just see the, the, the cook times. So there's three cooks, two cooks, and two cooks. So if I just move one of them, they all cook. This cooked 25 times now, this cooked 25 times, and this cooked 26 times. So that can be a problem when you're dealing with um, a huge list of a huge list of channels. So in this case, you might want to break them out to keep things from cooking. Um, or you might want to, uh, you could also use a chop execute. A chop execute. So when one of these changes, you run a script to 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 make that change happen uh, to wherever you're sending it. Um, and we're currently working on uh, optimizing this so that each channel has individual cooking um, uh, abilities. But we've been working on it for a while. It's quite tricky. Uh, but hopefully, in the next uh, the next round of experimentals, we'll we'll have something available for that. So here, I want to show a little bit about um, uh, cooking and the selective cook. Now, the null, null chop, and I know a lot of people play around with selective cook, but they might not know exactly um, what it does. So <clears throat> let me use the probe for this. Probe. Oh, I already have one available. All right, so here we go. Now we're going to look at just these nodes down here at the bottom. Sorry, it's a bit tight here. But this uh, this lag is causing uh, everything to cook here. And I'm going to, let me just turn off all these viewers and open up the parent parameters. So I have connected this control here to all of these constants. OK. OK. So what will happen is um, the select, the select, setting a node to selective will keep things from cooking downstream when they don't need to, but it will force things upstream to cook. So you can see here, uh, right now, this lag is this lag is cooking. Um, and that's because this is set to selective. But if I move this, hold on. OK. 
So you can see that the selective chop will keep things downstream from cooking when they don't need to, when there's nothing changing, but they will force things upstream to cook. All right. So um, anyway, th that is, you can use it, but use, use it carefully. Um, make sure that you don't put it too late in your network because then everything upstream will be cooking. Maybe if I go up a level here, this is a better example actually. You can see that because those the selective here and the selective here um, are forcing everything to cook, whenever I move this, it's causing those to unnecessarily cook. We don't need, we don't need that stuff right now because we're not looking at it. But when you're inside, um, it can keep things downstream from cooking. So, um, let me, I see there's a question there. Let me just get to the next thing because I'm running out of time. How much time do I have? I should break soon. So let me just show this one last thing. Um, and that's about preloading geometry. Actually, something's happening with my computer, so it might be a good time to answer that question. OK, it's back. How do we know when it's better to have more individual chops than a single chop driving all samples? Uh, it really depends on uh, what everything is connected to. If you have, a, if you have um, three or four channels and they are, they are connected to a huge system, making a big network cook, um, then I would say break it out. If you're not having a performance problem with it, if it's if you're just uh, running chop channels into a couple of small um, uh, parameters and not big networks are cooking, you can you can go with that. Um, so basically, if you're causing unnecessary cooking with stuff you're not using just by changing one chop channel, then I would break them out. And hopefully soon that won't be a problem. I, next year we'll we'll have a solution for that. Um, I don't want to use the cook bar right now, um, but uh, feel free to put it into to your file. Um, I'm going to take five more minutes. I know I'm. Uh, I think we have to have a break soon, so uh, I just want to show loading geometry. So geometry can be really heavy. Like I haven't gone into this network yet, um, but I have uh, some really heavy geometry in there. So if I was to go inside, now we'll just watch my timeline down here, how long it will freeze for, because it needs to load. OK, we loaded two pieces of geometry here. Um, so how can you avoid that? Um, you can get this geometry. Uh, I, I include some of it. You can get more of it at 3dcell.com. But for example, if I go up here and I select the other geometry, how can we have it so that it's instantly fast like that? So what you can do is you can force cook things. So this preload script, um, op loading geometry cook, uh, force equals true and recurse equals true, will cook everything inside this. So if I was to uh, just save this file, and I will start it up again. So we'll run that script, and it'll go through the whole network and pre-cook everything. So I'll just run this, run. Now the run script will obviously take time to calculate. But what you can do is you could set it up for uh, running the preload on start. So you could set it up in this um, execute that and say on start of the project please preload all this geometry. And now when I put a null, null top in, there's no drop in frames and I can select my other geometry and there's no pops or no drops of frames at all. 
Um, the same thing happens with movies. Um, if I was to, nothing has been cooked in here. And if I was to put a null here, okay, it's cooking the first movie. But every time I change the movie, uh, I'm going to get a super fast, uh, super high cook time. So if I change to the next movie, it's got to load that movie. And these are big 4K movies, by the way. It's got to load that movie and preload it and get a few frames ready. So it's a big cook time. So what you can do is I made this little script in here that is, um, it goes in and for all of the movie file in type operators, it does the preload operation on them. And preload is a method uh, in the movie file in top. So let's run that, run script. Okay, and now I can go to the other 4K movies and they're all preloaded and there's no, there's no pop. And now I can scrub them easily and there's no pop. So uh, I didn't include these in the folder today because they were too big, but you can download them all at the digitaltheater.com. They're just a bunch of 4K examples. I wanted something that had a heavy cook time. And sorry, I'm going fast, but I'm running out of time. So, um, and I'll answer a few questions during the break. So, uh, okay, I just wanted to, one more thing on um, optimized expressions, and then we'll we'll have our our break. So for Python, uh, a lot of you know that you can put expressions in any parameter. One thing to look out for is um, if your expressions are optimized or not. So if you roll over something, um, uh, some expression, you can see in the brackets, optimized, optimized, unoptimized. So any internal function that we have in Touch Designer, um, we've tried to optimize. And basically, instead of using the Python interpreter for this, we uh, actually make it call C++ and evaluate and parse it in C++, so it's much faster. Um, now this one here, you can see this clamp is not optimized. So it'll take a little longer to cook um, than something that is all optimized like this one. So let's see, this is 0.4 milliseconds and this one is 0.08 milliseconds. So you can see there's a little bit of a difference there. Um, it's also whenever a, <clears throat> whenever a, um, let me see, unoptimized here. Whenever an expression needs to be reevaluated every frame, um, then it, it will not be optimized. So this one, because the string is changing every frame, um, it's not optimized. So you could do instead, uh, just put val is, and then use this optimized expression down here um, and get the same result. But this one takes 0 0.09 and this one takes 0 0.05, so half the time. So that's just a way of making sure you're using the best the Python expression you can if it's available to you. 